our speaker for, for this morning. I'm going to ask Mark if you would come. And after, that's, that's okay. Uh, but Mark is the uh, Professor of Evangelism at Garrick Evangelical Seminary, and uh, we are so pleased that he's able to come and speak today on the uh, topic as we continue in this theme, Evangelism as a Bridge Building Practice, and the theme is Diverse Perspectives, Authentic Evangelists, the Art of Teaching Evangelism in Seminary. Uh, Mark also serves as our book editor, um, a journal editor, and uh, we are going to hear from him later in that respect. But diverse perspectives, authentic evangelists. Mark, come and lead us, please. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. the younger guy who's up front. All right, so uh, it's a pleasure to be able to, uh, to offer the presentation today, uh, especially because I'm talking about how we teach evangelism. And there are several of you who have far more experience in teaching evangelism than I do in here. I'm just finishing my fifth year in this position. Uh, and so I'm sure you have an awful lot to be able to offer. And so what I want to do is just walk through some ideas that I've developed in terms of teaching evangelism and then uh, we can enter into some dialogue around it. I've got three basic, uh, sort of three mini presentations within this larger presentation. The first is going to look at where our students are when they're entering into seminary and what it looks like uh, to engage with those students. Then we're going to move on to, I'll offer my definition of evangelism, uh, just so that we've got some clarity about what I'm using as the baseline. And then finally, I have what I call conceptualizing evangelism, which is a tool that I use for my students who, those of you who are sitting in class who uh, uh, have, uh, have, are having to do this uh, right now. My students have already had to do this, and Tom had to do it last year when he was in my class. Um, the uh, conceptualizing evangelism tool, which is a way that I try to help students articulate an authentic understanding of evangelism for themselves. So that's what I'm going to be uh, walking through with you today. And we'll take breaks in between each mini presentation uh, just to uh, be able to get a sense for how to, uh, or how this might, uh, or to take questions and, and see where you'd like to go with it. One thing I want to point out is that I was really pleased with what Rick was doing yesterday, in part because you left it off almost exactly at the point that I want to start today. And there was no collusion between us on this, so uh, it just seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit that it would be this way, I suppose. But uh, that is, uh, Rick finished last night by calling us to bear in mind the experiences people have had with evangelism, oftentimes negative experiences that have left folks wounded and asking for uh, folks to, uh, uh, to see whether or not they need some healing along those lines. And uh, I want to pick up on that point and say that that's where we oftentimes meet our students coming in. And so, here we have our happy little seminarian coming into, uh, into seminary for the beginning. And one of the things that I found is that students entering seminary courses are often deeply uncertain and even fearful about what they're going to experience in an evangelism course. Um, this is largely because the word evangelism does carry so much baggage. There's an awful lot of freight. Uh, the way that I've put this in other settings is that evangelism teachers are both the, uh, the, the conductor and the porter on the train. We have to get people to the next stop in their theological education, but we also have to help them check all the baggage they're bringing with them as they're doing it. And so that's what's going on. They're coming in, and, and it's oftentimes been because they've had some kind of negative experience of evangelism coming in. In addition to this, we have theologically diverse students. Now, I don't know in your own seminaries, different seminaries I know tend to attract uh, students from different backgrounds, in the mainline seminaries, in Garrett Evangelical, we get folks all the way across the theological spectrum. 
So just an example of this, uh, earlier this year, uh, this school year, I had in the same classroom a student who was uh, openly practicing homosexual, who was married to his partner. He had grown up in the Southern Baptist Church, but had left it and now was questioning whether he should leave the Christian faith altogether. His partner was a uh, practicing Wiccan. Um, so I had that. I also had, sitting two rows back from him, a woman who was an ardent supporter of Benny Hinn. And then I had, a couple rows over to the right, um, someone who had grown up in the traditional evangelical church going down to Moody and uh, now was trying to find a sort of broader way to understand the Christian faith. And I had another one who was a Lutheran who had never heard of mission in his life, who had become a Methodist because he had heard about mission, but he really didn't know what it meant. So I've got all this stuff, and then I've got a lot of just sort of bland, nominal, Midwestern Christians sitting there along with everyone else. So I've got this um, sitting there. How do you deal with that? Especially when you're dealing with evangelism, which is supposed to be a... Uh, um, evangelism, uh, when you're supposed to be dealing with the sort of heart and soul of the Christian faith. So if that's our initial... Uh, if that's what what's, we're dealing with, we've got to have some ways of making sense of this. Well, the first big problem, so this is the, the fish coming out and we need to build a bridge over, is building a bridge over the negative experiences that they've had in the past, these negative experiences. And a lot of students have had these. In fact, uh, my students and I have talked about this, and they're negative experiences both in terms of having been evangelized in ways that they don't like, but also times they've gone out as evangelists, and they've had trouble with it. They felt unprepared, or they felt lost and kind of left without any real sense of what to do. So how do we build a bridge over that initial gap that's there? And this, by the way, is the elephant in the room, and it's something I figured out after a couple years of teaching this, is that you can't ignore it. Um, you can't ignore this reality, because if you do, people will keep that shield up, and it won't be until halfway into class where they'll finally start coming out and being willing to engage in the uh, information that you're, you're bringing out to them. So you've got to find a way to overcome it up front. The way that I build this bridge is to share experiences. So experience, and this is again something that Rick was uh, touching on yesterday, but I spent a lot of time uh, sharing experiences in the beginning. So my students will tell you, the opening exercise in all of my classes is to ask the students to share the most miserable experience with evangelism they've ever had. Um, that's something that I ask them to do so that it gets out. They can say it up front. They don't have to be afraid that that's sitting there and that uh, they don't have a way to, uh, to acknowledge it. Oh, Cal, can you open the door for Patrick? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so they, they can get out and they can share that right up front. And, uh, and they don't have to feel like this is something they have to hide in the background because the professor will get angry with them because they're not happy about evangelism. It's something they can come right out and say. So we've done that. This class that's sitting here uh, with us has done that already. And we got to hear all kinds of stories about how uh, they, you know, some of them it was experiences where they uh, had to do evangelism. Many of them had been in youth group and one of them talked about how, uh, was this you Alex, it got dropped down in the middle of an inner city, three 12 year olds with a script. And you had to find strangers and go read the script to them. And if the people went off the script, you had no idea what to say, right? Um, and so people that had these very awkward experiences, and we share that. And one of the things I do up front is say, okay, all those things that happen to you, that's not what I'm teaching you about. <laughs> that's not what we're going to do here. So we can get that at ease and, and uh, build a bridge there instead of having people worrying that at some point I'm going to come in and enforce that on them. The other thing, and this is what Rick did at the end of his lecture last night, is I share my own experiences. Because I've been both evangelist and evangelized. And I've had both awkward experiences as an evangelist and downright frightening experience as evangelized uh, before. I tell the uh, story of the time that uh, I was at a Christian camp, and you know those camps where you're supposed to cry and hug at a particular point in the camp, you know, those, there, there was Christian camps that you do that. And we got to that point, I wasn't crying, and I didn't want to hug these other guys because they were kind of sweaty. And I figured I'd make my way over to the snack table, because there was a good snack table. Um, and so I was gonna, they're all hugging and crying, and I was making my way over. 
and I was reaching for a Twinkie, and as I got about six inches away from it, suddenly my feet went two inches off the floor. And one of the camp counselors had come over to me, got me in a bear hug from behind, and he said, I saw you leave, and you just need to let me know you love Jesus, man. Just tell me you love Jesus. And I'm like, dude, I just want a Twinkie. I'll love whoever you want. Just let me have my Twinkie. You know? So I've had awkward experiences being evangelized as well. And I'm willing to share that so that the students know that I'm on the same page. I don't like it when people force me to believe something, and I don't want to be in a position of doing something to other people they don't want done unto them, which is how Steve Gunter describes the way that uh, we often perceive evangelism. So we build a bridge initially by the sharing of experiences and taking them seriously, because whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, they're authentic experiences people have, and we legitimate that. The next major hurdle that we need to build a bridge over is the assumed theology. So we have these students coming in with this vast array of the theological backgrounds. And in doing that, um, with that, one of the struggles with evangelism is the assumption that you have to be an evangelical to do evangelism. I don't know how many of you teach this uh, who often find the difficulty uh, of students who will interchange the words evangelical and evangelism or evangelicalism and evangelism um, and just assume they're the same thing. And uh, that's because, of course, historically evangelicalism has been the primary bastion of where evangelism has been practiced in the United States. But notwithstanding, most people can't get past that, even though that's not the only place that you can do it. They assume you have to come out of an evangelical background. And so students are nervous about the potential that one of the things I'm going to do is I'm the uh, sort of the, uh, the, the kind of fundamentalist spy that's been placed in the mainline seminary whose job is to sort of grab all of these unwary progressive leaning Christians and haul them back over to orthodoxy. Um, and so how do you get past that concern? Well, the way that I help to build the bridge on this is to offer a variety of theological voices. Um, you provide texts, movies, other resources, whatever you can, where you let a variety of people across the theological spectrum, whether evangelical, I include the evangelicals, of course, but there are also liberationists, black theologians, uh, woman theologians, uh, or people doing uh, uh, womanist theology, uh, people doing... Uh, uh, Pentecostal theology, it's interesting, Pentecostal theology is actually one of the least understood in the mainline denominations, uh, the mainline seminaries, I find. Um, and we look at all of these different, uh, across the theological spectrum, and I uh, introduce texts and resources in which people from all of these different backgrounds are talking about how they engage in evangelism. And what it allows for is for students to recognize that they can authentically engage in evangelistic practices and practices where they're manifesting the good news of Jesus Christ out of wherever they are on the Christian theological spectrum. Um, so in my theology of evangelism class, I teach a couple of classes, I have at the, the opening part of class, they're going to be reading something from Letty Russell, they're going to be reading something from James Cone, they're going to be reading something from uh, uh, Belly Matty Karkinen, uh, Karkinen. Um, they're going to be reading all these folks, as well as Wesleyan, uh, James Logan, uh, some of his stuff on Wesleyan theology. Um, we're going to have all of these different kinds of theologies that I'm offering so people can see you can do this stuff. Um, we're going to read some of the Latin American liberation theology authors. And we're going to look at all that stuff to see that you can do evangelism and still be authentic wherever you are on the Christian theological spectrum. Um, and when we do that, I help the students try to understand how this is still evangelism by having them go through this little chart. And they have to work out these three questions. Who is the evangelist and the evangelized? So they look at who that's defined by, by this theology. What's the method for evangelization that's being used in these settings, or out of these different uh, theological backgrounds? And then what are the hoped for outcomes? And one of the things that they can begin to do is realize that, in fact, um, there's a potential for being able to support one another. So if the hope for outcome for the liberationist, um, just a very 
I'm just going to gloss it here, on a very basic level, is for a world of uh, where systems and of uh, political and economic systems have been um, made equitable and just for all people. And the goal, say, for the, uh, the uh, Pentecostal is for people to be delivered from demonic and addictive forces. You can see how that can actually come together. They don't have to fight each other. There's a point at which you can bring these two together. Both of them can bless the other's work. And they don't have to agree with all the theology, like Winston was saying before. They don't have to agree with all of each other's theology, but they both can see why the other is part of the full body of Christ, accomplishing something that needs to be done for the witness of the world. Having done that, it leads us to the next major thing. This is why it's the big, angry monster guy here. Um, you can deal with this on a theoretical level, and people can say amen to it, but then you actually have to deal with other people, right? It's one thing to say, you know, I guess on sort of a theoretical level, I can, I can buy into why the liberationists or the evangelicals or the Pentecostals or somebody might uh, have something worthwhile to do. But does that mean I have to actually talk to an evangelical? Do I have to actually talk to a Pentecostal or to a, to a liberationist? Um, well, yeah, you do. <laughs> That's part of the unity of the body of Christ. And so then it's getting you to be, getting the students to where they can speak to, engage with other people that come from different places on the theological spectrum. One of the reasons this is so important, quite frankly, is because we do a really good job of deconstruction in seminaries. We deconstruct all these theologies, right? Well, how do we help them construct something so that they can engage constructively with each other, with people from across the body of Christ? And that's what I'm really pushing toward here. So in dealing with others, the way I try to bridge this is to help students articulate their own beliefs. Uh, and the word articulate is something that comes out a lot in my pedagogy. Um, because students come in and oftentimes are not ready to articulate their own beliefs. And that's understandable. I mean, particularly, again, I don't know about your seminaries, but, but uh, our seminary now, our, our median age of uh, students coming in is 27. It's getting younger and younger. And so you've got folks who are coming in, they're, they're still in a very formational place in their own age and their own development and their faith formation. So they're not ready to say, this is what I believe in, in very full terms. And part of what I want to do is help them articulate what it is that they believe. Many students, all they can do is come in and say, I'm not that, right? Unfortunately, they're mimicking civil discourse because that's how it goes anymore. You know, the, our, <laughs> I'm not in favor of what that person at the podium is presenting in this legal structure called Congress. I'm not in favor of what that guy wrote in that op-ed piece. That's about as far as civil discourse gets us anymore. And so students are mimicking that they don't have as much the capacity to construct and say, this is who I am. This is what I believe. Now, admittedly, they're going to say it in a provisional way. Seminary is where we do provisional theology. Students don't come and figure everything out right away. I haven't figured everything out right away, right? I mean, or I haven't yet. And uh, that's all right. They're going to be developing a provisional voice, but at least articulating in their own voice what it is that they believe. And so I begin to push the students to ask them, what is it that's so potent that keeps you a Christian? You don't have to stay a Christian. I mean, there's nothing that forces you to do that. It's a chosen identity. So why do you do it? What's the purpose of doing it? What's so good about this that you stay with it? Likewise, what is that hope is so good that you would want to invite others to participate in it? Students can begin forming and articulating these ideas for themselves. And that's really pretty important uh, that they be able to do that. And once they can do that, then they're much more capable of being in dialogue with others. One of the big stumbling blocks to dialogue is not an unwillingness <coughs> to talk to someone else. It's the inability to articulate where you're coming from. Good dialogue isn't sort of just stepping on eggshells around each other. Good dialogue is being able to say, this is the fullness of who I am, share the fullness of who you are, and now we can really talk about this. But if students aren't equipped to articulate who they are and what they believe, even in a provisional way, they have no way to engage fully in dialogue. 
once they're equipped to begin to explain this about who they are, then, then they can begin to enter into dialogue and even invite others to come and see from their perspective, wherever they are on the theological spectrum, what it looks like to be that. And they also are secure enough in who they are and what they believe that they're willing to be invited by others to come and see what the others are doing. Well, that leads us to the goal, which I hope will happen, which is that the students can then go out and encounter each other authentically. Um, they can, we've taken their experiences seriously so that that's no longer in their way. We've acknowledged there's a spectrum of theological belief and they can position themselves wherever seems like it's comfortable for right now on it. They can begin to articulate in their own voice, not just in the voices of the authors they read, why that is what they believe. And then they can move forward in encountering each other in a meaningful way. Um, and I think encounter is powerful. I mean, I, personally, I like the, uh, the work that Emmanuel Levinas does around encounter, the phenomenology he does with that, where encounter is something that is transformative. It's in the encounter with another that I not only am transformative to the other, but the other is transformative to me. You never leave it without having been touched and changed by the other one. And so this is equipping students to enter into that transformative process of encountering others. And God willing, maybe even encountering people who are outside of the Christian faith, being formed and transformed in those encounters, and also forming and transforming those that they do encounter as well, in the name of Jesus Christ. So these are my opening assumptions about how to engage with students. And the next step I'm going to take is to talk about how I understand uh, and define evangelism itself. But before I get there, are there any questions or any conversation at this point? Please. Um, I, th I think you, you frame this in a nice perspective of, of how we teach this in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I like that you ask them for their most difficult evangelistic failure. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder, though, how you counter then having uh, started off with a lot of examples of that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an emerging group think, an emerging metaphor mm -hmm. that evangelism is a bad experience. The way that I do that is a, is a couple of things. When I teach it online, um, I, do, I teach it two ways. One is an entirely online course, and one is a face-to-face. -face. So in the online course, um, I have them, I, I don't allow the students to share it with each other. It just comes to me. And it, so it avoids the group thing. And it comes to me, and what I do is I will respond to it. And I acknowledge, I always say, you know, it sounds like this was really terrible. I, I can appreciate where you're coming from. Um, and then uh, say, you know, it sounds like you have um, these sorts of views of what evangelism is. Uh, you might be really interested in this text or in this, uh, you know, lecture that's coming up. So that I can prep them to see that there are antidotes to where they've been before. So for the online, I do it that way. Uh, for the group, uh, for the face-to-face -face group, the way I do it is I have them share these in, uh, in small groups, usually groups of three or four. They'll share it with each other. And then we'll do a debrief afterwards where I'll say, okay, so just call out, analyze what you just shared with each other. Call out what was it that made it uncomfortable for you. And so I'll put up on the board, you know, people will say, well, I felt unprepared when I was dropped in the middle of the city streets. Or um, I felt like there was arrogance in how it was being shared with me. And I'll list all of these attributes. And it, so it becomes an analytical process and a reflective process so that they're not just focusing anymore on the experience, but they're beginning to analyze what made it uncomfortable. And, uh, and then I can get into saying, okay, what I do on the back end of that is I say, all right, now that we've seen what we don't want to be, let's look at some ways that we can be. And so this class, just to give you a sense of the, the students here, we shifted straight from that to reading all five of the Great Commission accounts in the Bible um, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And, uh, and said, okay, let's, now let's put up the attributes that we see showing up in those. And, and that becomes the antidote then, because it shows here, I mean, I'm letting the students in on all my secrets now of what I'm doing pedagogically, but, um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, now they're gonna like, oh, well, now we know what he was doing, so we don't have to pay attention anymore. But the, uh, uh, 
that's, that's the antidote, is to say, like, look at what scripture actually is talking about evangelism being. And all the things you describe, that's not what Jesus was telling us to go do. <laughs> um, and so it, it's, it's giving them a new alternative and recognizing that what they experienced was actually an aberration from the biblical model of Good. evangelism. Good, thank you. Sure. Please, uh, Martin and then Rick. I liked it very much how you deconstructed the different positions, uh, tried to bring them together. But uh, I may be a captive of, mo of modernity, so uh, I, I wonder uh, how is it possible to bring Christians together on the one side, focusing on justice and peace, mm -hmm. uh, without seeing the need for conversion, and on the other hand, a Christian, a sound conservative evangelical said, it's all about conversion. Mm -hmm. How can they work together? Well, that's... I let me okay, see if, that's the, the, next if, the, if okay. the next steps. Let me okay, see if that right. answers it. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, circle yeah, back okay. around there. Good. So, Rick? Uh, just one, one comment. I just taught this last semester. I teach evangelism at, at Wheaton, but I also recruit a lot of the people that come in, and, and uh, most of them actually are fairly positive toward evangelism because they're taking a master's in evangelism and leadership or a master's <laughs> in missional church movement, so they're not likely to get to the degree with lots of barriers, but I just taught a course at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, mm -hmm. and you would expect everybody, you know, it's 40 students, you would expect all MDiv students, you would expect all of them to be at least somewhat excited, right. and 90% uh, at least came up to me during the course and said, I completely dreaded taking this course. Yeah. I, I did not want to have anything to do with this. This is my last course to get my MDiv. <laughs> that, all That's of that it. negative yeah. energy and all of those negative, negative experiences were as true of the mm -hmm. very evangelical. That, wow. And the other challenge I faced, though, was a number of them thought, you know, kept wondering if I was a heretic. <laughs> you know, that's the other trouble that you have there, because some of them come with such clear, rigid ideas. Yeah about who are the real Christians, um, that it's very hard to, for them. And that's a, probably a problem. Uh, I don't know. It's a little different. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't get that often. Yes. We're Methodists. We're already here. <laughs> so that's all right. I mean, we're already here. <laughs> and then I, I have to add one other thing. The communication part that I was going to do last night that will become another talk sometime has different models. And one of them is out of theories of communication, the dialogical, which is the same thing you're talking about, Lemmy Nas and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I have a wonderful story for you about a woman who just kind of captures that power and magic of encounter. I'll mm. send it to you, but I think it is very, very, it's one very powerful model of evangelism. Terrific. One of the support. But thank you. I appreciate it. Well, just out of curiosity, those of you who are in the class right now with me, Garrett, um, how many of you were not looking forward to taking an evangelism class? <laughs> Anyone? One, two, no, only two. That's actually the best I've done so far. <laughs> so usually I have, a, I have several more that come up and tell it me. It was that. way better than what I got. Okay. <laughs> well, wow, I can't believe we're, we're ahead of Trinity on that. This time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just don't spread that around, or at least don't tell them I said so. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll edit that part out of the video, so that's it. All right. Well, let me talk about how I define evangelism to try to bring people together around this. Um, and to do this, I have what I call a non-advocating normative definition. I don't burden the students with explaining that part to them, but it's a non-advocating normative definition. Um, let me explain a little bit about that. So and I'm not going to spend much time on this because Rick actually hit this very well yesterday when he was working through uh, Billy Abraham's uh, understanding. And you asked who, who had uh, read Billy's stuff. And Billy was on my dissertation committee, actually. Oh so I spent three years with Billy. And he's, he's, he's wonderful to work with. Um, but uh, there are lots of different um, going ways of understanding of evangelism out there. One of the things that I've realized, though, is that when you're coming in as a student, you don't always know this. You see the same language, evangelism, missional, I mean, the same vocabulary across the board, and you don't necessarily recognize that you're dealing with some very different understandings of evangelism that are on offer. Uh, and so I actually spent one summer when I sat down and I just read through a bunch of evangelism texts simply to ask the question of how do they define evangelism um, what's the methodology that they use to uh, understand it or to, to dig into it, whether it's ethics or history or, or theology or what have you? Um, and who are the exemplars that this author puts forward as the great exemplars of evangelism? Uh, because that will tell you an awful lot as to who the exemplars are. 
Uh, so you have that, and, and you come out with this. I don't have all of that. If you're curious about it, I actually am getting that published as an article of missiology next year. But um, the uh, one of the things that, that I came up with is that there are all these different ways on offer of defining evangelism. So Billy's idea of initiation into the kingdom of God, um, some folks refer to it as entrance to Christian discipleship, some participation in a virtuous practice, uh, proclaiming the gospel verbally, hospitality to explore spiritual things. I was here two years ago uh, at this meeting where Richard Peace was giving his uh, presentation and he defined it by the last one there. Mm -hmm. um, all of these are very helpful, and uh, as Rick spent a lot of time last night, they're all very helpful. They all have ways that they can be critiqued, and they all have ways they can provoke us to better understandings of evangelism. The one thing I also noticed is that all advocate for a certain theology. There's a certain underwriting theology to all of them. Now, that's understandable. That's appropriate. But it's also something that needs to get flagged, uh, because if you don't flag it, it can get hung out there is kind of an essentialized view of evangelism, and it's not put in its proper theological context. And I began to think, how do I develop a, de a definition of evangelism that is not going to advocate for a specific theology, to make room for all these students who are coming in from all these different backgrounds that may not buy into the sort of uh, the theology that's in the background behind these definitions. Um, so, I thought I need what I came up with is I needed a normative but not advocating definition. Normative in the sense that it is uh, still hanging on the the gospel message. It's still about the way that we believe God is calling us to be. That God is redeeming the world through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. That I realize there's theology wrapped into that, but that there's sort of a, an irreducible reality that it's calling people to normatively. But by the same token, non-advocating, because on some level, it's allowing for people within the spectrum of Christian theology to be able to engage with it. Um, and so, in some ways, and this is a little too grand, but I was thinking about something like the Nicene Creed, right, which has certainly theology in it, but it's a narrative. It's, a, it's the story of the Christian faith from creation to believing in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And, and so you've got that narrative there, but there's so much room within that narrative to be able to position yourself theologically. And that's what I wanted to try to find, is something normative, but it's not advocating for a specific spot on the theological perspective, or spectrum. So I came up initially with the idea that, and this is what I, I work with now, is that evangelism is a bias that it's a bias. And, and I know that that's a dangerous word to use. I've had people explain to me, but the word bias is negative, and we have to avoid that. I get that, and I understand that, and I agree we have to be very careful with this. But it's also provocative, and it gets people thinking, and especially in academic realms. If you're not being provocative, what good is it, right? So I, keep, I, I hold on to it for that reason. Um, evangelism, and I realize I'm not doing the Greek here, I'm doing the English. Um, but uh, evangelism is a word that ends with ism. And all isms are biases. Racism, sexism, you know, you name it. Capitalism, socialism. I mean, they're all claiming for something being superior over something else. Whether it's one race is superior to another, one sex is a, uh, superior to the other. Uh, one form of, of uh, how you organize uh, the ownership of capital and labor is superior to another. I mean, they're all a way of claiming a bias for one thing as better than another thing. And, uh, and evangelism has an ism tacked onto the end of it. It's claiming a bias. Now, we do need to be very careful about this, because obviously evangelism is a bias. If you take this in the wrong direction, it's going to add significantly to the sins of the world. Um, and we don't need to add on to the tragedy and the evil that the world already has. And if we're doing that, we should pack up shop, go home, and stop hurting the witness of Christ. And heaven knows it's been used that way in the past at times. Um, so I am aware of the danger there. Notwithstanding, I think that this can be a helpful way in, because evangelism is a bias for the good news. Evangelism, it's a bias for the good news. And the good news is precisely that all people have been given the opportunity to share in the redemptive work of God through Jesus Christ. And so as a result of that, no person, and this is the key issue, no person 
is ever seen as inferior by this bias. The bias is always in favor of people. It's always in favor of creation. What is, it is biased against is anything that would hinder people coming to share in the redemptive work of God. And so it pushes back against that. And so, again, wherever you are on the theological spectrum, you can find something here. So if you're taking a liberationist stance, you can find that those things, those political and economic systems that are unjust and therefore that refuse to allow people more fully into the just reign of God manifest here and now are things that need to be resisted. Or if you're an evangelical and you understand that there are certain ways of, of orchestrating your, your life morally or there are certain ways of of uh, certain things that you can be called to believe in that are going to cloud your mind and your thinking, you resist that. The point is, is no person is ever judged anything less than one that God has a bias in favor of. God privileges humanity and creation being called into redemption. So it excludes no person. It just resists that which would hold people or hinder people from entering into the redemption of God. Based on that bias, then, the next step is the need for a full conceptualization. Because that by itself, if you just leave that hanging out there and you don't begin filling it in with proper theology, it's going to cause serious problems, and I know that. Um, but if you then take this basic idea and you begin to fill it with the theology that the students are articulating, even provisionally, you begin to develop ways that they can say normatively, I want to call people into this redemptive work, and I want to be able to do it that all people are going to have an opportunity to share in it. And then here's how, here's why I want to move in that direction. And so the next, this is sort of my bridge presentation, the next one over, we'll talk about how I developed a, a tool for what that conceptualizing process looks like. But before this, because I know this is the most provocative part of my, <laughs> of my presentation, I want to give you a chance to, to respond uh, on this idea of the definition uh, of evangelism as a bias for the good news. <clears throat> I've seen a lot of people crinkling up their foreheads as they're thinking about this. On the one hand, they think there's merit to it. On the other hand, there's something about it that makes them profoundly uncomfortable. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, go or, ahead, George. Oh, or you can cast it so far down the road into the future that we're waiting to have further revealed. I'll say that. Um, you, you're doing something marvelous, I mean, my judgment, of. of tending to persons in a way that invites them without sort of creating a particular box that they must inhabit. But nonetheless, it's not non-committal Correct. either. Uh, but it's, it's, it's I, I hear you searching for sort of the elemental piece that, That's it. that would obviously connect with the five commission statements and other things frequently, but uh, also says, um, yours is not just to find a way to evangelize and go out and do it, but it, it is to do the hard work of discovering what fills that, what, what is going on with that. Uh, I, I like the word bias. Uh, I think that's almost all you say, except that it's not good news. Uh, right. I, I appreciate what you're doing. But I'm, my furrowed prayer brow is trying to see where to go next with this. Where's the, yeah, and I, I agree. There needs to be a next piece to it. And we'll see if my next piece is what you think is useful to it. I, you know, I, I obviously, I mean, I understand in some ways that I'm, I'm trading out the freight of the word evangelism for the freight of the word bias here. And I get that. Um, but again, it's, it's just provocative enough that I think it... And, it's also helpful that not every ism is necessarily like a terrible evil ism. You know, it's not all racism and sexism, and that's why I, you know, can talk about socialism or capitalism or these other isms that are out there to show that how there's a there's a bias or, you know, if I want to soften it, preference for you know one way of, of constructing things over another. Um, but it's 
It's also meant to do something that Len Sweet's a big fan of, which is to try to, to, to offer alternative metaphors, um, alternative uh, language, just to get people thinking in new ways. This may not be the best way to do it, but it is a provocative way to do it. And um, provided that I've got enough credibility going in with the students at this point, usually it's not something that will jar them um, in a negative way, but it will jar them in the sense of, of uh, giving them new ways to think about uh, the container evangelism is and how they can fill it with their own, their own theological uh, perspectives. Go ahead, Art. How do you move students into critically evaluating their own conceptualization once they've arrived at that? That's a good question. When they hit to, well, you'll see the conceptualization piece next and how I have them work through it. The way that um, primarily I have them do it is uh, through case study. And so once they've come up with a conceptualization, then they have to apply it to a case and uh, to see how well does this work in real life when I'm uh, trying to connect this case with the way that ministry is being done in a local church uh, or in a parachurch organization or whatever it might be that they're looking at and see how that comes out then. Uh, and they also have to present it in front of each other so that they get peer review um, and, and a sense for uh, is there a blind spot that they've got along the way. So it's, it's by entering in community, it's by having them presented in community. Because my assumption is that their conceptualizations will always be provisional. They can always change. Um, and so the community then becomes the safe place, hopefully by this point, to be able for them to articulate where they are and to hear feedback uh, that will allow them to modify change, et cetera. That, does that mean that, that evangelism then becomes normative, normatively a local theology? In many ways, yes. I, I really do think that uh, evangelism is best worked out as a local theology, um, on the ground, on the ground. I mean, I'm not going to uh, localize it so much that we don't have the, uh, you know, we don't have the sort of broad uh, sweeping pillars of the Christian faith of, you know, there's always going to be the Trinity. There's always the redemptive work of, through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. That stands. But the rest of it works out locally, yes. Good, Cal. Um, maybe I'm being too picky or missing it, um, but it seems like evangelism is a bias for the good news. It seems more like a feature of or an aspect of evangelism, not a definition. And that seems like a very general statement. Yes. Because I'm thinking you can probably put in thousands of other words for evangelism, getting the same, you know, preaching is biased to the good news. Sure. Teaching Sunday school is biased to the good news. So I'm wondering how, are you saying that all of those activities are evangelism, or uh, I'm not, I'm just not clear on that. Well, that's, so that's where the next step comes in. So the conceptualizing is when we begin to do the narrowing work. And when, when the students get a chance to begin to work out how exactly are they going to fill that. So yes, it is raw, and it's meant to be intentionally open and, uh, and, and allow for a lot of give there. And that's so that the students have room to make their provisional claims about their theology and uh, their understanding of how to enact that um, on a specific level. So see, I mean, when I hit the next uh, presentation, See whether that fills it in for you appropriately. If it doesn't, we'll, we can come back around. And, uh, and just along with that, uh, and so I'm very interested in what you're doing as well, okay? and supportive of what you're trying to do. It, it seems like this step, on the one hand, is trying to keep something normative, mm -hmm. but even more so methodologically, it seems the point is to emphasize the inclusivity of the gospel. So that all the people that are with you in this evangelism course that have expressed their negative experiences and heard a diversity of voices mm -hmm. now feel like I've been empowered by this definition to bring all of the diversity I represent into the conversation. And all you've done is, in a sense, the normative is there, but the higher priority in your methodology and your pedagogy is to try to create a conception of the good news at equals inclusivity. That's, I think that's a fair description of what I'm trying to pull off here. Absolutely. And I'll be honest, I mean, I came out of a, a very evangelical background myself. And, and 
you know, when push comes to shove, I tend to, to, to move back in that direction in my own, my own devotional life. Um, and so there's a part of me, like, like my teenage self, is always yelling at my grown-up self, saying, you're a damn heretic for putting together this understanding of evangelism. Um, you know, because I'm, because it is so open, and there's the, the part of me that says, no, it's like, you know, John 14, 6, you know the way this is supposed to work. Um, and, um, and so I've got that internal dialogue going on, just so you get a sense of where this is. But, but the reason I've gone in this direction is that I can't, it's just not, a reasonable way to approach evangelism with uh, with the folks that are going to be coming through the seminary, at least our seminary, um, and to to start from that vantage point. And so I'm privileging that inclusivity without, I mean, trying very hard not to lose the, the pillars of the sort of core orthodox reality that everyone, you know, whether you're liberationist or you're womanist or whatever you might be across there, everyone's going to pretty much buy into. Um, so yes, that's that's what this is. So is there a danger in, in terms of? Well, let me come over here, oh. Eric, because he uh, sure set his hand up. Mark, thank you. Uh, this is very helpful. I suspect your students really like what you're doing. <laughs> I and uh, I wouldn't venture to say right at the moment. Okay. But <laughs> <laughs> we, we will take a survey here. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, but, but the fact that you've chosen to, to shift from being the sage, sage on the stage, that you're, you're now a resourcing person, you're empowering uh, students, and, the, uh, the, and, and what's, what's curiously potent, heuristically, pedagogically, is that evangelism needs to help a person ask the right questions and think their way yeah. towards a closer relationship with God. And so you're actually modeling that in helping students think through how am I going to work with that person in that way. So, so you, so em, empowering uh, the bad evangelism we know about is is the one that doesn't empower and tells you what you should exactly. say here. And so you you, you flip that. Um, there's. Uh, I see two places, and I, and I suspect you do it later. Maybe not at this step. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, but questions that are out in the air. One of them is, is actually defining that good news, and you, you alluded to the fact that you've got this, this dialogue going on, that, and, right. and that Jesus Christ is at the very heart of that. And that's, but then the, the other would be uh, the, whole, the, the issue of, of who does evangelism talk to? And is there a... Uh, is there a target audience to use a communications word? Absolutely. And those ought to be, I would hope, people who are beyond the boundaries of, of, of Christian witness or who have a distorted, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking about Absolutely. This, right? And that tends to come out in the authors that I assign as to who the target audience is. What's interesting is that most of the students come in expecting that I'm going to focus primarily on those who are outside of the pale of the Christian faith. And many of them leave saying, you know, well, yeah, I guess I should be in dialogue with, with these other groups and other people as well. But it sounds like a lot of people inside the church need to get evangelized based on what we've covered in here. Um, and so... Well, I'll put you in line with the reformers. Well, that's it. Exactly. And so, there, and particularly if you're United Methodist, I mean, it's in line with where we yeah. are in the denomination. Um, and so there's a, a sense in which um, we talk about evangelism being something that can be practiced internally to the church insofar as we're continuing to help people into, uh, more fully into the formation of their faith. Um, I, I do agree with Billy Abraham on this point, that there are a lot of people who are malformed in their faith because they never were fully, properly initiated. Um, and so uh, there needs to be that work that's done, as well as then reaching out beyond. So we don't spend a lot of time in my courses talking about specific target audiences and how do you reach these specific people. But we do talk about you know, who is it, the importance of being in dialogue with both internally and externally to the church. Thank you. So, yeah. OK, Eric, let me come back here. You no, know, I wonder, is there a danger in turmoil? The inclusivity you were talking about, getting people in composition, 
and with respect to the truth, what is true across the board, and, mm -hmm. and how people who come on it, you know, how do they articulate that for themselves? Is there a danger across the board? Potentially. Um, there's always a danger that people will take this and define Jesus however they want to. Um, but my, honestly, the way I approach this is very similar to the way Rick was talking about uh, dealing with his sci-fi group, uh, or the alpha group, which is that I'm coming into the classroom, even though it's a seminary classroom, um, with the assumption people need to kind of start where their experiences are. Um, and to share their questions where they are, and to work that out. Um, because there's a lower and lower, and again, I don't know if this is across the board in other seminaries, but there's a lower and lower level of catechesis that we can assume for especially our master's students now coming yes. in. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, a lot of them are coming in, and I'm, I'm doing confirmation class as part mm -hmm. of my seminary class. Um, and if I don't let them do that sort of initial engagement with the faith uh, on that level, I think I'm going to lose them if I if I hit it at a higher pitch and make some assumptions, and so that's why I'm. I think the greater danger. I mean, it's a calculated risk, but the risk, the, the greater danger in my mind is the danger of trying to pitch something at a certain level of uh, sophistication and orthodoxy that will lose people that are still in the process of trying to figure out what this whole Jesus thing is, um, even though they're in seminary. Go ahead, Art. Are you describing a process in which, to some extent, the, the catechist becomes his own catechist? Uh, <laughs> I can't get the whole word out, but catechizer? <laughs> yes, Is, that's exactly it. So, so you're asking people to teach themselves the, the, the essentials of what uh, of, of the that's it. It's, it's a way of, I mean, don't, students, all close your ears for a moment. My, my assumption here is that some students need to learn the good news. I mean, that, and, and so part of what I'm doing is I'm evangelizing the students themselves. But I'm trying to evangelize them by teaching them, giving them the tools and equipping them to, to articulate that good news and claim it for themselves rather than my proclaiming exactly what it is and saying, now you receive this and then go, go do something with it. How, how do you figure out how much guidance you need to give them in order to help them to discover what is authentically the good news rather than something that they make up that seems good to them? Yeah. No, I hear that. And, um, you know, it's really, you're almost at the point of pastoral care. Um, some of my classes, I actually will call off a class meeting and I'll say, let's do one-on-ones uh, next week. And I'll have them come in one-on-one -on -one and we'll talk it through. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I, it really is. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of fly by the seat of my pants and, and, and by feel at that point. So, yeah, George and then Bill. Uh, in regard to both of the comments about the risk of being so open or, or inviting them to be known, it seems to me that what you're doing is a different kind of move. It's a way to dislodge all kinds of default things they've already done, all, all kinds of ways they've already defined it. You're inviting them now into a circle of conversation with you as, as a catalyst and with the fellow students, and obviously already you've tipped your hand that scriptures are important to this. Yes, I do have. And, and so you're inviting them to renegotiate their default versions that they were maybe self-formed or a collection of influences. You're inviting them to be active and to look at the materials that should inform responses to this, which I think takes it a different way from just, you know, you choose whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like, so what George said, take that as my answer to your question. So, Bill, you want to we'll finish out and then I'll go to the next yeah. one. Um, there was a normative way that early Methodists understood evangelism. Absolutely. I think there's a normative way in which we can say that early church understood it and it's reflected in the synoptics and in the, in the tradition of Acts. Um, I work with several boards born in ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, working within the United Methodist tradition, I understand that we, under, we look at the MDiv as a gateway degree 
into the local church. Mm -hmm. And that we are equipping people, men and women, for ministry as pastors in the right. local church. And that's the purpose of the MDM in our tradition. And that when we look at the discipline, one of our understandings is that the evangelism class, which is why it is required, we are going to equip students to do and model evangelism so that the local church then becomes an outpost in terms of both uh, missional and attractional understanding of, of being an evangelistic community. Sure. So that we're making disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. There you go. Um, and I, I'm always a little bit concerned when I get to the end of my class because I, I, I have to deal with people as they are when they come to me. Right. Am I equipping these people and are they leaving here with sufficient competencies and motivation to engage the local churches to which they are going, to which we're equipping them to go, and lead those communities? It's not just an individual, whatever I want. How am I leading as a ordained right. elder, leading my community in an evangelistic task to which the church in general has committed to me? I'm with you. I, I'm with you in that. And, you know, my hope is that if I can get students to a place where they can claim something authentic, and that's what this next piece really is about, claim something authentic, they'll have something, a basis on which to be able to move in that direction. Um, I offer two courses, partly to try to fulfill this and to, to ease my own conscience on this issue. The theology course in evangelism is meant to more explore the, the sort of theoretical backgrounds. And then, of course, this is the course that's here today, is the Empowering the Congregation for Evangelism, where we do more of the, the practical piece, spend less time on this, and more on um, what does it look like when, you in, you know, when you're planning worship? How, do you, how does evangelism help in, uh, inform that? When you're uh, putting together your administrative structure, how does evangelism fulfill, you know, help inform that? I said what I said because some boards of board in ministry are telling me, hey, the products we're getting, these people don't know how to take evangelism and translate it to the local church right. so that the church becomes communities, evangelist communities that make disciples. And the denomination the local, and the conferences are concerned about that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hear that. I, that's a, I understand the critique, and, and I, I try to, to get there. I don't know, you'd have to ask my students if I'm doing a very good job of it, but by the end of next week, they're going to have to do a presentation where they've actually gone in and they've analyzed the local church in light of their evangelistic practices and then uh, make recommendations for how they could improve their various ministries to, to uh, take that in. So I, I hear that, and I'm trying to, at least in one of my two courses, to, to approach that issue. <laughs> All right, well, conceptualizing evangelism, thank you, by the way, for the give and take. This is, this is very helpful. Um, and if, you're, if you really like what I'm doing, contact Erdmans, because I sent all this in as a book proposal about a month ago, so I'm waiting to see if they want to publish it for me or not. Uh, so conceptualizing evangelism, I stole the word conceptualizing from Billy Abraham, actually. Um, he, makes, he uses the word once in uh, logic of evangelism, and he's used it also in conversation uh, with me when we were down at uh, Perkins. And uh, his argument is that you can't just define evangelism alone because it's got too much stuff going on inside of it. There's the content, there's how you share it, there's the uh, sensitivity of the people to, with whom you're sharing, there's all this stuff. So you need to conceptualize it because you have multiple concepts running inside of it simultaneously. So it's kind of an un unwieldy, it's a very sexy term, but conceptualizing evangelism is what I've got. Um, and the way that I ask the students to do this, um, so this is my last, this is the big event of my course. Um, they may not see it this way, I don't know if you do, but for me it's the big event of the course because this is the big synthetic task that I want them to undertake. And that is to conceptualize evangelism in its fullness. Um, and so there are three inputs, you'll see there on the left. They have to sort of think it through and identify the themes and then they come out with what I call their conceptualization of evangelism. So the inputs. First is the starting point, and this is based on two questions. Um, what motivates you to engage in evangelism? So, you know, with all the other background we've been through already in the first two uh, mini presentations, what is it that motivates you to do this? Why would you go out and evangelize? And usually their answer is connected to the second question is, what do you think God's ultimate goal is for humanity, for creation? And what is it that you think God is going to do that's so good, that's so redemptive, that you want to share um, with other people? 
Um, this is, I mean, if you think about it, in some ways, it's, it's uh, you know, the simple example of this uh, is, is the standard brand evangelical way of doing it, right? Um, that God has determined that, or maybe this is closer to fundamentalist, God has determined everyone will go to heaven or to hell, and so you're motivated because you want people to go to heaven and not to hell, right? But whatever it is that your, your theology is that goes into this, whatever you think God's ultimate purpose is for people helps to motivate you to get out there and to evangelize. For the liberationist, it's going to be the fact that God is going to create this new uh, just world, uh, the, the world of shalom that's going to be brought about, Isaiah's uh, peaceable kingdom. And so that motivates you to get out there and manifest the good news then by helping people to begin to participate in justice and to advocate for justice. So what's your starting point? What is it that God's going to do that you think is just awesome and you want people to, uh, th that you want to invite people into? Once I've asked the students to uh, think about that, I then explain to them, you need a theology. You need a theology because it's the theology that will define and fill in all the bits and pieces along with that. So, you, and um, this is something that I learned from Kendall Solon way back when I was doing my MDiv in, uh, in uh, Systematic Theology back at Wesley Theological Seminary in DC. And uh, he said, all systematic theology is, is, boils down to three questions. Who is God? What has God done? And how do we respond? Um, and if we can start with this, this initial thing that we think is just awesome, that God's going to do, and we want to invite folks to participate, and that motivates us to get out in there, we can also start answering the questions about what we really believe about this God. So... If we believe that God is a God that's going to bring about the peaceable kingdom, well, who does, what does that say about the nature of God? What does that say about how God operates in the world and relates to creation? What does it say about how we relate in return to God? And students can begin to, here's where they're sort of catechizing themselves, and they begin to work out how it is that their theology is formed outside of this, this great expectation that they've got. Um, and it's an, another piece of this that I like is that it helps students begin to understand that theology is less a matter of a series of sort of serial containers that are next to each other. You know, here's where we put Jesus, here's where we put the Trinity, here's where we put salvation, here's where... And, and you know, sort of we separate them out. And that's the way they're often taught in our seminaries. And what this does is it shows that theology is much more like a spider's web. Because every piece is linked to every other piece. And so if you're going to skew it in, in the direction of saying, well, this is really all about, in the end of the day, it's all about God bringing about the just reign of, of, of the peaceable kingdom, then that's going to change what you think about who God is. It's going to change what you think about how God relates to the world. Um, it's going to, everything pulls and tugs on each other. And that's part of what I want the students to realize, is they need to be coherent in their theology. It needs to connect, and they need to see how those connections come about. Uh, because that's how theology works. And so I have them begin to work through this. Now, in my class, there's not enough time for them to get all the way through it. And I'm cognizant of that. And that's where I'm relying on the fact that I'm part of a larger curriculum that includes systematic theology and the history of the church and, and all those pieces to help them get the information they need to fill in. But at least I can help them begin get a framework to understand how all these pieces connect to each other. The big buzzword in our school right now is integration. I don't know if you've heard that show up at your church or your, your schools or not, but I mean this is a, this is a part of how we're moving towards integration and how I do it in my class. So once you do those first two pieces, you, you've got your starting point. You know what excites you about what God is doing, and then you've got some theology of understanding who this God is and how we relate to this God. Then from that, I tell the students get creative. Come up with some practices. What does it like, look like to do this on the ground? Um, sometimes the way I do this is actually I, I set up a, a, an equation for those that, that are a little more mathematically minded. I have the starting point plus theology equals practices. And I say, you know, come up with something here that, that actually is a, a legitimate, authentic way of demonstrating what you believe up here. And, and it's interesting because a lot of students get stuck here because they keep thinking, well, practice is evangelism, so I need to hand out tracts, I need to go knock on doors. And, and I say, but up here, that's not what you're saying you're interested in. That's not what's exciting you. 
what's something authentic down here that you want to go do based on what you've set up here? And so it's, it's helping students create that process of determining what's an authentic set of practices, not just the old standbys, because that's historically how we've understood evangelism. Once they've come up with this, what I tell them to do is take the whole thing and give it a name. Think it through. They start to, so you've got all three pieces, and you think it through. And to say, um, you know, what are, the, what are the themes that you see throughout here? What are the commonalities? What is it that's sort of all the way through here is really what's important to you? And I said, give it a title. Because titles, as you know, are supposed to take it and, and give the essence of what's, what, what's being entitled. And so I asked them to do that. Give the thing a title so that you get a sense of how you can articulate sort of what's most important to you about your faith and how you live it. And put that title on there. Again, this is all provisional stuff. One of the things that I usually tell them right before they do their presentations is, remember, on the day that you face the great white throne of judgment, you will not have to defend this as having been the way you need to live for, you know, from this point forward. It's okay to change your mind about it. But provisionally, where are you right now? It's okay. So they think it through, they give the whole thing a title, and that's what I call a conceptualization. Is when the whole thing is entitled, and you, this whole piece here is their conceptualization. All of these are the pieces needed for evangelism. The starting point, what excites them about the faith, the theology by which they define it and work out the nuances and implications of it, their practices, and then finally how they are trying to sort of squeeze the essence out of it and understand that. That's their conceptualization. And so I have one class session where after we've done the opening stuff, usually about not quite a third of the way into the class, where I will introduce this process here. And I will then ask the students to, uh, to take some time and develop it. And I have different kinds of assignments in which they'll do it. Some will write uh, sermons. This class is writing a sermon. Some of them have to write uh, much more, in the theology class, they have to write a more developed theological uh, paper that, that engages with it. But different ways of them trying to put this together. And this, honestly, is my great hope, that having authentically articulated now, so they've, we've, we've been through their experience, we've gotten them to the place where they can think through and articulate what they believe, and then they can claim it and say, authentically, this is how I can practice it. What I've hoped to have done is three things. One is to overcome the negative stereotypes of evangelism. Second is to expand their notion of evangelism. The third is to, uh, to then claim evangelism in a way that's authentic to themselves. And then the fourth, which I haven't done, but which I hope gets done, is that they will be so comfortable with it they'll want to go out and do it. Because evangelism spoken about but never enacted is useless. <laughs> Um, and so my hope is that it will then inspire folks to go out and become evangelists. And of course, that's the pedagogical fuse that we light, and we may or may not ever see, or may come back years and years later, and we'll find out. But notwithstanding, that's the, that's the sweep of it all. So any, any thoughts on this piece or responses? I think uh, our challenge is to the last part where we have to, the starting point, from the starting point to the theology, seminary student can go there quickly, you know, start quickly on that aspect, but the practice, the practice aspect of it, and how does that translate to the local church? Mm -hmm. I think that is the challenge. Uh, and, and the expectation from the church, or, or the expectation on the Passover, brings and and how do you help the local church to even to celebrate their starting point because they have some concept of who God is mm -hmm. or the theology and how can you help them to move forward in terms of oh we're focused because most local churches are even more focused they want to take care of themselves and in some way you have to pay the bill you have to do this but how do you help them to see the bigger picture in doing evangelism and the practices that will help them to say, okay, we are doing something already. How can we expand that? And I think that is key. Well, I think, and, and that's a big part of it. I mean, just simply on the practical level, um, I think a big part of it is helping s churches celebrate what they've already got that's outward focused. Um, I, 
I know a lot of churches that are inward focused, but I don't know of any church that is inward focused to the absolute exclusion to anything outward. Even if it's just vacation Bible school or something else, there's always something. And I think helping them to celebrate that and recast that um, or, or expand on what they've already got, that's, I think, the best way to go. Because evangelism has been the site of an enormous number of guilt trips in the history of Christendom. Um, and uh, I think that we have to, to back away from that and instead move in the direction of celebrating where they're getting it right and seeding the ideas of, of uh, see, you're already doing this. This is, this is who you are. This is your identity. And, and you tell them that enough, and they'll start to believe you, you know, and then, then move forward. At least that's what I did when I was in the local church. Um, and I think the other part of it, and, and this is something we talked about in class, um, is remember in, when we're looking at the Great Commissions, we talk about um, the fact that there is no commandment without promise. Um, and so every commandment to go out and, and share the gospel or to, uh, to, to make disciples or baptize or whatever it might be uh, comes with promises as well. And I think that it's also a matter of helping the congregation uh, be formed in those promises so that then they're capable of going out. Because you can't ask them to, to go out and to do something they're not equipped to do yet. Um, and, and, and being formed in the promises of Christ, I think, is a critical piece of that. While listening to you, I was very much reminded of Robert Schreiter's uh, constructing local theologies, mm. and I thought you you give room for individual understandings of um, evangelism. But so far, I understood uh, Robert Schreiter. He says these local uh, theologies have to uh, get together <coughs> in a kind of critical uh, communication mm -hmm. and looking to the Bible for guidance, uh, because. Uh, Local theologies have to be open for external critique Absolutely. and for biblical guidance. So, where is biblical guidance in this whole process? Because so far, I understand authenticity. It is actually a radical step further uh, in, well, in individualism mm -hmm. or romantic way of understanding individualism. It's so the for me the way in my course that that would take place is that I always start. I mean the, the opening um, opening sessions of my course once we've done gotten through the initial baggage and that sort of thing is to move into the scriptural understandings of evangelism and to found so the course gets grounded in that at the outset um, and then the community piece as I was saying earlier is that these are conceptualizations that then the students bring forward with each other and, and share with each other so that they get feedback. And I actually have them do peer review of each other on their presentations. Um, as well as, like I said, I mean, there are times where I feel like there's enough concern I've got about what's going on that I'll actually cancel the full class and we'll just meet one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'll meet one-on-one -on -one with students. So I do try to have safeguards in there to make certain that it's not just authentic to the person, but authentic to at least the broad uh, stream of, of, of the story of the gospel, the, the biblical understanding of the gospel. You may have mentioned this actually earlier in the class, but um, from the liberation uh, theology perspective, uh, action precedes reflection, yeah. whereas this is reflection preceding action. I, I'm thinking about, um, as, as you were talking about, confirmation classes, I was thinking, oh goody, this is something I could use in a confirmation class, except um, teenagers in a confirmation class haven't had any experiences to figure out some kind of starting point. So th is this specifically for master students who have run some sort of gauntlet already, have established some kind of uh, cache of experiences um, so that you, you already have the experiences? That's a good question. Um, you can flip it around. And in fact, I've, I've been pushed on this by, by some, some of the uh, liberationists before mm -hmm. who talk about the importance of praxis and how the practice informs the, uh, the development of the theology. Mm -hmm. And from what I can tell, I mean, this is my way of thinking, so that's why I put it this way. But I think you can flip it around. If you have certain practices that you take as, as essential to who you are and to, to what you operate, then I think you can do the sort of um, deductive work to say, okay, we do these things, why? And you can begin to tease out your theology and your starting point from it. So I think you can flip this around um, and uh, have, you know, have the practices 
uh, and the starting point, because I think the starting point is still going to be there for most people. They've got a sense of what the good thing is, however vaguely mm -hmm. defined it is for them. Um, you could have the practices here, and then you could have that equal out into the theology. So yes, I think you can flip it that way. This is just academics starting their head, and then get to practice. So that's why I said this one. So Art, I think the I think the form formational component that you talked about a little while ago is 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 really key too, because otherwise it's a concept, it's an idea that's out there and that you put into practice. Without that, without that, uh, it doesn't become spontaneous and natural yeah. until it is formed within two. So I, you know, in reflecting on what you said, I would say that really, you really need to not lose that, mm -hmm. but uh, keep keep a strong emphasis on that formation part of it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Mark, you're just helping me so much. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> But I'd like to piggyback on what Art just said. The, I know so many institutional, you know, people who live, work in Christian institutions, denominational executives and so forth, and they, and they have done the steps that you've said. They've had experiences, they, they probably led churches in this. I, I, I even know pastors, but they will be effective in leading their church in evangelism, but what happens is that the needs of the church are so intense and time mm -hmm. uh, demanding that it just sort of swallows up free time to dedicate to this other. And you, and you see this consistently, especially among professors and, mm -hmm. and, and denominational workers, uh, where there's another step of, of uh, creating habits and uh, setting priorities mm. and learning to hew to them uh, across days, weeks, months, and years. And uh, that might be another part that you'd want to add in, maybe not here, but wherever you consider appropriate. That's helpful, thank you, both to you and Art, because I think that formational piece that takes this the next step on is is very helpful and like I said I try to do some case study work but that's not you know that's not going to get to the point of habit formation that you're talking about so thank you for that Let's see, Rick? Yeah, yeah I suppose this is uh, maybe in a different way kind of just continuing to build on that thing it seems like given who you uh, teach and lead and the kind of diversity you have in the seminary you've designed a wonderful process in a sense to fully initiate you know, in a real sense, to articulate their faith mm -hmm. and to articulate how they want to communicate their faith to others. And that's a wonderful process for people. Um, and what you can do, I don't know how many credits the course is, but it's a three credit course. Mm -hmm. Enough to expect from a three credit course. But then it just seems like there's a whole nother level. Like, I don't know how well they can lead others in the process you lead them in yet. Mm -hmm. I don't know how able they would be to take it into a local church or lead a local church, or help the people in the congregation. You know, he asked about confirmation. There's a whole kind of set of needs at different levels and stages of people, and people need full initiation. So you've helped them, I think, maybe learn mm -hmm. and be initiated themselves more fully, but then there's this process on top of it, and so I guess I'm waiting for your next course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to echo what Rick is saying, um, because I've been sensing here the danger of being a student who experiences this finally comes with their sense of it, and now they become a pastor. And so they tell people, this is what we're going to do, because I've worked this out. Right. And, but they will inherit a community of people that have that same diversity of experience, yep. of theology, mm -hmm. of, con of, of issues surrounding their experience of evangelizing or being evangelized. Uh, in other words, it, it becomes a greater pastoral challenge and learning to know how this is the way in which a pastor best helps a community. So they internalize this, so it becomes natural to them, it just in the way you experience it in this class. Now that, that's a daunting sort of that further is. challenge to, to those becoming pastors. It is. I can't answer to the, the, the last part of it, but I can say that um, 
and, and the students can back me up on this one, that um, I also have one class session where we talk about congregational cultures and the importance of reading the culture. So the, the, the line that everybody's picked up on now is that I, I always tell the students, because this is what I was told when I went into my first pastorate, was when you get there, if there's a dead cat under the back pew, leave it there a year before you throw it out. Um, and uh, so you have to figure out why they love the cat and they keep it there, even though it stinks and it's driving new visitors away. Um, and uh, get a free movie. <laughs> <yeah. laughs> and, uh, that's and so we do. We talk about the importance of not going in and enforcing these issues, but of, of coming in and learning the congregation first. So that's where actually I pick up on the anthropological side of missiology, and, and I say we need to do. I, I have them shift the metaphor, and I say instead of thinking of yourself as pastor, which is more staid, I and mean, the shepherd of a sort of existing flock. What does it look like if you see yourself as the missionary going to a mission field in your congregation? You have to learn the new language and you have to learn the new culture, etc. So. All right, one more, and then I guess Winston needs us to move on. But go ahead, please, Mark. It's a fascinating presentation. You enriched my understanding. I want to probe a little bit of your pedagogy, if I may. Sure. If this would take too long, let me know. But as students begin with their starting point, and you alluded at least twice that different students come into your courses at different starting points right? because of their level of catechesis prior to entry. Mm -hmm. Is that right? In the, in the, I guess in the first few weeks of your course, uh, you will explore that starting point or help them establish a starting point and then to formulate some kind of theo theology based on your scriptural reflection. My question is this, as they develop those individuated practices mm -hmm. of evangelism, when do you get to the assessment of that, or helping students evaluate those practices based upon their theology, theological position or the scriptural reflection? That's the big assignment. Um, that's, the, that's the big integrative assignment at the end of the class, um, is they have to, um, depending on which class you're taking, I have different ways of doing it. This class has to do a, a presentation in front of everyone else. Um, where they'll present it, and uh, and I give them I, and and I give them I mean a significant amount of feedback on these issues. Um, they also along the way in, in my online class they have to go in and they have to uh, share their um, their ideas of of these different pieces with each other. I put them in, in uh, discussion forum groups, and they and they have to share these ideas with each other and defend them to each other. And it's really interesting because the students are far more incisive often than I would be in, in, uh, but when they're talking to each other about it. And then what I ask them to do is actually create a common um, conceptualization of evangelism within the group, which is an absolutely fascinating task. And it scares the living daylights out of most students because they're different places on the spectrum while remaining authentic. And, and I say, you've got to figure out how do you agree on what you want to agree on and what you're going to be willing to let go of so that you can, you can come up with a common one with, you know, within this group of four? And, uh, and help them work out constructive, collaborative theology in the process. Interfacing at the same time. Exactly. Authenticity. And I will, and I sit in, and I, I read all of their back and forth, and I, you know, I'll, you know, if I see, I've only once had had real serious problems come up in this, but otherwise, you know, they're they're really hesitant, they're tentative, they don't want to, you know, offend each other. But once they get in there, they actually create some really good stuff. I'm curious how, how they do it online in so, online modality. Yeah, it's it's in a, it's in a wiki format. So they go in and they basically have a have a Google Doc, and they're going in and they use different colored uh, different colored fonts for each other, and then they're reading each other's stuff and responding, and then finally they usually determine someone will be the final editor that'll bring it all together. But it's uh, it it really is fascinating. So that's how I do it. Is again in, in community, and I stay very much tied into that process. So I'm constantly giving them feedback. I'm constantly saying. You know, I see you're talking about this, but does it connect with that, or is it true to this? You know, just one quick story, because I know we need to finish. I had one student that, um, in uh, one of the classes, I required that they write a sermon where they would uh, present this idea to a congregation. So I say, you can't use seminary words, right? You've got to use the words you'd use to share with a congregation. Um, and uh, how would you describe this to your congregation? And this one woman wrote a very nice sermon when she talked about God's conquering of, of, of evil and death and all this sort of thing. And she spent all this time on the incarnation. And at the end of it, I, I, I wrote back to her and I said, this makes a lot of sense, but where's the resurrection? 
I mean, you're, you're talking about the conquering of evil and death. You know, and and um, this is one of those classes where I did one-on-ones because I just there was the need for it. And uh, she came in, and we were talking about it. She said, well, I'm not sure I believe in the resurrection. And I said, oh, okay. Well, I said, why, why is that? And she's, you know, she was kind of bringing up the historical issues of, you know, well, you know, could someone actually come back from the dead, and et cetera. And I said, but your theology here is one of the conquering of evil and death. And I see how the incarnation gets you part of the way there, but the resurrection is really our sort of exclamation point of how God does this. Um, and she's like, yeah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And so she, she thought about it, and she came back um, the next week, over the weekend, she got to rewrite the sermon. I, everyone was getting a chance to do it. She came back and she said, you know what? I'm going to celebrate Easter this year. And I said, well, praise God, you know. But it's, uh, you know, that's, it, that's where I do it, is, is just engaging with their, their assignments and offering them back uh, lots of feedback. Uh, to, to make sure it's coherent internally and also connects with the larger Christian story. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Mark? Mark? This guy. Oh. <laughs> Mark is the East Stanley Jones uh, Assistant Professor of Evangelism at Garrick Evangelical <laughs> Theological <laughs> Seminary. <laughs> And um, much of what he said is on the website, and I pulled those three out just now so that we can look at them. He has three primary goals in teaching evangelism. First, Mark wants his students to expand their views of what evangelism is. Secondly, he wants his students to claim what evangelism means for them. He calls this conceptualizing evangelism. And thirdly, he wants his students to be empowered to become evangelists. Please Amen. thank Mark for his evangelical seminary. <laughs> <laughs>